Hello, good evening and welcome back to another episode of our The Wasted Hour podcast. This is Martin and for this episode I met with fashion designer Yang Li. One day after his fashion show in Paris, we talked on the bench outside of his showroom about stuff like the influence of skateboarding, studying at Central St. Martin's, dropping out, being an intern at Ralph Simmons and of course music. Make sure to check out our selection of Yang Li at the Wasted Hour shop and look out for the second drop of the season next week. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you enjoy. First of all, welcome and thank you for taking the time today for making the talk. My pleasure. Um, like I said before in the beginning that the main purpose of the interview today is to introduce us to our readers and from the digital magazine mm -hmm. and let them know about the world of Yang Li. And I wanted to start like a uh, like bi biography because you grew up um, in Beijing. Right? Yeah, that's correct. I was born in Beijing. Yeah, in 1987, yeah. Since, since I'm correct. Mm -hmm. um, what's your memory of China at that time? Um, a lot of concrete and dust. Uh, I, was, I was raised in Beijing in the city and um, both my parents were... Uh, sorry, my, my father was... Um, part of the Chinese military okay. and um, working for the government, not, not as a soldier, um, it was actually a sports, like a government sports player, oh, ping pong okay. player, yeah. um, at that time because it was no professional sport or professional anything. Yeah, but did you then also participate in the Olympics or was it just like no, in China? No, I mean it wasn't that good, yeah. it was more like a military squad kind of oh, thing. Okay, yeah. um, but you know, it's my, my memory of Beijing is it's like another world of what it is today. You know, yeah. I'm going there uh, often, like at least once a year. Um, but not only the, you know, it's obvious the, f the physical changes, but also the kind of people and psychological changes of the Chinese. That's probably the most striking because when I was young, obviously when I, you know, I was five years old, six years old, I left when I was 10. Um, the, I think, the, the, the Chinese people are much, much less open-minded than they are today. Okay, yeah. so th this changed. So, um, but my biggest memory is kind of, why does everything have to be the same yeah. back then? But now it's, it's changed a lot. Okay. But then, like you said, you moved um, when you were 10 to Australia, mm -hmm. to, to Perth. Yep. And I read in the internet that there you came in contact with um, skateboarding and basketball. Mm -hmm. like this yep. Was this your first um, contact with more subcultural stuff? Or? Yeah, I mean, it's my first contact with any kind of um, non-mainstream or any kind of culture, actually. You know, because in China, when you were young, The, the school is very textbook based yeah. and um, you know in the 90s there was not you know, also when you were five years old six years old you're not roaming the streets so I guess I was lucky in some way that during this kind of 10 to 18 years old period I was let loose in Australia um, which is a very important time I think like yeah I think it's, it's a the kind youth. of building yeah. building your character And um, yeah, th those those are the two things that I kind of were obsessed by, yeah. um, and especially a, a lot of skateboarding because skateboarding is not just you know riding around on the skateboard; it's kind of hanging out with a group of people um, continuously for a very long time, yeah. and um, you know you, you you're meeting people from different age groups, uh, different kind of classes, what have you, uh, and. You kind of grow up very quickly yeah. you know, when, when, you're, when you're doing that. So that, that was quite important. And that introduced me to like music. Um, and most importantly, like when you're skateboarding with friends, it's kind of like a tribe. So starting to pay attention subconsciously to like how to fit in by dressing or, act, or, or your attitude. Yet the goal is to be different whilst you fit in, yeah. you know, within your tribe. So. Oh, it's, a f it's a funny that you say that because I started skateboarding too when I was nine, so mm -hmm. like 20 years ago, and I spent like the from nine to 19. I always say I spent my youth on the streets skateboarding, yeah. 
Um, in Hamburg? In, in now in Munich, okay. actually in Munich. Yeah. And just like looking back now, when I, when people ask me how do mm. you get like into fashion, architecture, and stuff and style, I always say like I think probably it's skateboarding too because you. Yeah, I think it's the only sport where you're not in any competition which is like points based or yeah. like qualitative and it's more like your style makes you good or better you know mm. um, and I think it's also the only sport where or the only sport slash activity where you yeah. don't really have a um, training system or you know it's it's very loose and, and, fle and, and flexible yeah it's very self-learning and also like mm. from the people you hang out with you learn yeah absolutely yeah. who was your uh, favorite skater back then do you remember oh I had many I mean I don't know if you were if they had this in you but do you remember 411 yeah of Media course magazine? yeah always the opener was the yeah, most so I was important watching thing a lot of that and then I was a big fan of shorties yeah fulfill the dream was that like the dream yeah. yes and then guilty I, I, I can still like I know all the parts. Yeah, you know that 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 part with um, where did the children play? When yeah, it's really nice. Um, and they were riding around like on horses, and the shorties fulfilled the dream, and that the kind of this the stripe thing too. Like yeah. it was the shorties yeah, team. Yeah, I mean now. that was kind of like the first film where it became kind of creative. Totally, yeah. You know, of course there were lots of you know amazing skaters before, but. There and then when Spike Jones did all those like high videos, yeah, that was a bit later on with like Ga Ga I mean Guy Mariano is one of my favorite skaters. Yeah, he's one of, of the he's of one of the goats. Because yeah. of his story also, you know, yeah. that he came back and things like that. But um, yeah, so many and like Peter Smolik. I don't know if you know. Yeah, him. I know. I, I know definitely oh, know man, him. Yeah, I'm sure he's like that. In, and he's still in ripping. that video yeah. in the fulfilled dream video. Yeah. He's he was so technique yeah, already his, back then. His, his yeah. style was really good. Muska, of course, crazy guy. Um, I just heard the story because then Muska did like a um, mm. three and a half hour interview on the Nine Club and then yeah. he talked about... He's kind of gone insane now, right? Yeah, I don't, he had a I lot of know. crazy phases because he was mm. then like in Hollywood and yeah. like partying but now he's like totally sober and like vegan and everything doing and he's doing, he's doing art. art yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it was really cool but he just said like about the full, full, full the Dream era that he also like produced like his own song like yeah, this, yeah, this Beats. Best, yeah, the Muska yeah. Beats stuff. <laughs> and it was one of his first beats that he produced. But yeah, it was kind of like drum and bass and breaks. I, I, I have like, I think he only did like four songs. Yeah. Them all. But then he did like a whole album later, which was like... I think my first ever email was Muska Beats, like Hotmail or Yahoo. <laughs> <laughs> so I know it very, very well. Yeah. yeah. And it was also like an iconic thing because like his board graphic back then, you know, like the, with the, the silhouette, the silhouette thing like, the, uh, the with the red, with the, the sun or the one before the him? one before like the yeah. silhouette oh, where he's sitting like yeah this. and yeah. we are sitting on the red one everyone you was, had the red was one? A, I yeah. had the green one yeah the green one was a little bit smaller i think mm. like from the yeah no they're the same but just the steps change colors yeah <laughs> no so yeah, cool. they were, i'm very nostalgic about those you know yeah. uh, about that period yeah mm. for me too it was very raw like to experience everything like at that time too and then i fully dived into it when um Flip Sorry came out, and then Yeah Right by Girl, that was mm. totally a game changer. Yeah, of course, like Eric Coston. Yeah, the, the um, Michael Jordan of skateboarding. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I even have one of his boards where it says Coston, and it's like the Jumpman logo. Yeah. Um, no, they are, they are great. And of course, Mark Gonzalez, I really liked. Yeah. Um, and he's really artsy as well, you know, like yeah, Jamie Thomas. Yeah. Um, Misled Youth was a great video. Like that period, I don't. I mean, I don't pay attention to it very much now, but yeah. that was definitely super influential. Mm -hmm. you know? Like to see Jamie Thomas skating like black skinny jeans with his shaved head, yeah, and like hoodie, just the, and the like zero that. and not doing any tricks, just jumping downstairs. Yeah. It was like different stars. You know, you could see that almost like Fashion Week now. You have different designers, you have different skaters. So yeah. That was really important. Great. Yeah. So, how do you think that? skateboarding uh, influences you in now like what you're doing now with designing can um, you pinpoint it or i mean i don't necessarily like you know i'm not looking at it as okay we need to do a skater gene or anything like that but it's more the attitude is important you know what i said to you before um kind of creating a tribe or belonging to something but being different at this whilst you belong to it i think that's that's really important and i and i think the kind of um, 
almost no rules part of skateboarding culture. I think that's definitely something that I um, applied to my work a little bit. Yeah, I um, can totally see that. And I think it's more like a feeling that you mm -hmm. get from skateboarding while I saw a lot of other brands just like picking a certain style or just the skateboard itself. Yeah. Yeah. When it became more yeah, and fashionable, of course, you know, like sk skate, like street, street style or street, streetwear and skateboarding clothes. Um, they've also changed a lot, you know. Totally. Throughout the years, now that now it's become very close to um, street streetwear. Totally. Whereas before yeah. you had like a big skate skateboard shoe market. Um, and they all more or less died down and now it's... Yeah, and I, like, I, I think in the beginning they were using like Nikes and stuff yeah. and Converse and then in the late 90s, early 2000s, you had the skateboard industry. You know, I remember I had a pair of the Muska shoes. From with Circa? The, with the stash pocket? Yeah, with yeah. the pocket. <laughs> and then I used to cut another tongue to get the double tongue. Yeah. You know, I used to, I used to, there was a period where you wanted to make the foot fat. Totally, Big yeah. jeans, like that was a very Peter Smolik thing, you know. Yeah. He was like so. Who was right? Who was the D three? Was um. It was Dave Mayhew's shoe. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah this is the, the one where you put two tongues. Yeah, <laughs> and also like the laces are so big. Um, I know. I don't even know how we skated in those. It's, I think nobody skated. No. It's it's more like plastic, but it was more like a fashion statement even back yeah. then. Just oh, we we those. skated in them. <laughs> I don't know how we tried. <laughs> like we would have been much better without them. But. Yeah. No, but it was kind of a statement. I think it was around the time I always wanted to have it, but it was so expensive. And mm. I always bought like the reduced stuff from, but DC was my... Uh, you were DCs? Yeah, I yeah. wore a lot of DCs. I like the custom twos from Etnies. They were so sweet. From S? Or the, yeah. yeah. Oh one, yeah, not yeah. Etnies. Yeah, S. from S. Yeah. yeah, I had them in like a yellow, black, something, like in the colorway that yeah. was reduced. With the, with the E. <laughs> yeah. No, those are really those are really cool as well. But it's yeah, it's interesting. We I could talk about all day like oh, know, this interview will be out skateboarding shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Just diving into that. No, but I think it's amazing to see like um, also like how big skateboarding and has become. And Kareem Campbell, I yeah. really like Kareem Campbell. Yeah, he, he was, was so stylish. Totally on he, with like the City Stars mm. brand that he had in action shoes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he embodied something definitely. But I think like yeah. nowadays... It's funny that all those brands died away. Totally. Alphanumerics, they had like beautiful campaigns. Yeah. Like image campaigns in magazines. Yeah, they were paying a lot of attention to um, the skateboarding companies to embody something or to mm. market someone. Even now, like Ma Ma Muska was like a... Even the Muska was a brand itself. Yeah, you know, like, of course. Mm. And it's great to see and um, how they did it. And in skateboarding nowadays, like it's part of the Olympics, like it's so widespread out. There's like the more mm. athletic part to it, yeah. and I think it's great that some skaters can make a living from skateboarding. But there's still like the whole raw culture too. And you see, like there's the crew in San Francisco right now. It's called GX1000. They are so raw. They're just bombing like hills, but uh, they're right. skating yeah, yeah. and they're skating everything. Because back then for me it was like either you like jump downstairs or you're more technical. Mm. Like I had the feeling that yeah, I had I mean, to the, decide. Yeah, the level of skateboarding is like out of control now it's so good yeah but it's yeah. amazing to see everything and someone with skinny jeans doing like a very very technical mm. trick and now they can do the skaters can do everything like it kind of yeah. kind of opened up yeah just like speaking to you i have to step on a board soon like <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but yeah like moving more forward then from australia you moved to london in 2007 and yeah. because you were accepted into st martin's to yeah so i finished the high school and um i already knew that I wanted to do something in fashion yeah and I heard about the school and I thought you know that's the best one so let's try and luckily I had a sc I, I got accepted and got a scholarship to, to go to that school yeah. um, but how did fashion come into place because you not got just accepted into St. Martin straight away there has to be like a, some pre story no pre, for you with, with no pre story no pre story no, no, I mean you make a portfolio and you yeah. apply I didn't know how to sew I didn't know anything um, but I guess, you know, looking at watching those skate videos, looking at the magazines, also like paying attention to music a lot. Um, at the time I was DJing also with a friend that I was skateboarding with. What kind of music were you playing? Oh, we were, we were beat juggling. Okay. We were like 
technical DJs. <laughs> <laughs> was that, I don't know. And like scratching behind the back or like to... I mean, no, more, more beat juggling. Okay, yeah. yeah. And scratching and things like that. So like listening to hip hop. And, oh, that's amazing. Um, you know, I mean, we, we, we listen to so much different music, but this was interesting for us because when it was too dark to skate or too... Um, you know, we, we could be in a room and, and play, play music. So like what teenagers do, I guess. Um, but I think being so like aware of and like so into all of that kind of visual culture, it made applying to a fashion school kind of natural because you just had to make your own magazine or own video kind of yeah. thing. I mean, I was making like, um, skate videos and putting them on GeoCities. I don't know if you remember that no, website. No. It's like maybe a very early version of blogs. Yeah. Um, you know, we were like editing our little... Yeah, you had, yeah you had like your crew and your own video too. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so I guess from a very young age, you learn how to tell a story yeah. and that's what fashion is. So that's, so. I just put together some stuff and um, sent an application. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah. Well, cool that you got accepted. And I thought that. it would be really, really difficult, but when I started, it was really, really easy or casual. You know, I thought we'd be like there for ten hours a day, yeah. seven days a week, that kind of thing. But it was like in six weeks you have to do this. See you in six weeks. It was very independent, which is nice because. Moving from Perth to London, um, it gave me a lot of time to do the same as I did in Perth, but learn on the streets or yeah. you know, meet people, visit the stores, go see bands, and kind of you know, the city was the school. Yeah, where you dived into like the London, mm. London scene a lot. Yeah. But then you um, left St Martin's, although you dropped out before graduating. Yeah, I stopped St Martin's um, because we had this like you have an option to take a gap year, yeah. and I went to Antwerp. Um, and I, I, I assisted Raf Simmons uh, there for, initially it was only for six months, but then it went on really well, so I stayed for two years. And um, But did you dive at like, was it during your London time that you dived into like fashion and discovered Raf Simmons, or was it even before? Before um, that, in, no, it was in probably Australia. a bit, a little bit before, you know, yeah. when I when I was like searching what fashion is on the early on what dial-up internet that we had, and which um, made those noises when you yeah, and connected there with were it. a couple of designers which like were doing stuff uh, like Ralph Helmut, you know, this kind of mm -hmm. um, uh, and and. I was like, oh, but these are kind of clothes that we are wearing anyway, yeah. and this can be fashion. So that was quite a good uh, eureka moment. So I thought I need to go and get some experience there. Cool. What what, um, what did you learn at Raf? Um, I uh, a lot <laughs> <laughs> because like it always says <coughs> it was like such when a you small team. So. Yeah, that's what I heard too. Like mm. um, I think at that time it was like five people. So. Um, it was very personal, we were in all the fittings, and um, I guess I learned there how to kind of put something which is in your head into clothing and also create a environment where you can communicate that to yeah. people. Yeah, because you described it like in articles on the internet, it's always referenced as a creative kitchen. Mm. Like, yeah, it was literally a kitchen. Like sometimes we worked in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> that gives a whole another meaning to the yeah. to the word. Yeah, but that's what I heard too. That Raf at, at back then, even though he was like so big, it was really such a small team. Mm. And I think yeah. that what's that's what the rawness also like is about. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and it's great to see like how the brand developed and where he is now. Yeah. Um, but then when you, after that, you got back to London and you decided to start your own label in 2010. Yeah, I started in 2000, not 2000, 2011. Yeah. 2010, I probably registered my company yeah. and did nothing. <laughs> um, but our first season was spring, summer 2012. Okay. So yeah. it's probably late 2011. But that, I mean, that's what I wanted to do yeah. anyway. But yeah, where does the, I, I, where I did it came from to you? To, to, you wanted to do your own, mm. own, own label? Yeah. 
even like back then when you were at St. Martin's? Oh, or? when I was like 15. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. I guess it's, um, I don't know, I mean, if you're going to do something, at least you should try to reach the maximum first. Yeah. You know. What's and, and I like, you know, it's such a demanding job and such a, it has to be very personal, so I think, you know, to have, to create the ability to have your own voice is the most important. Absolutely. Yeah. Not, I mean, of course, working for people like Raf or other designers, it's, it's, it's very uh, rewarding as well, but um, that was my, like, first step, I guess. Did you have like a business plan laid out before you started, or was it more? No, no not really. <laughs> <laughs> I, I it was very quick, you know, very quick. I, I made like a very small collection. Uh, we had an amazing factory, and um, like three weeks before the fashion week, we decided to have a showroom, and luckily, five of the world's best stores bought the collection and. From that, I can do the next one. Yeah, that's great. Because I heard from you because you received like a lot of press and buyers. Because I think I discovered you through uh, Style Zeitgeist mm -hmm. on the on the forum, yeah. and was struck by the from the images, like from the beginning and from the aesthetic. And also, like I heard that the uh, quality was very good from the beginning too, which mm -hmm. is somewhat unusual to a new starting brand. Yeah. Like, how did you were able to take care of the quality straight away? Um, I went to Italy and I, I went personally to um, some of the best factories and then talked about like what I wanted to do and uh, you know the first collection we did was almost all double face yeah. um, cloth and double face manufacturing which is quite <coughs> like an old um, very couture way of making clothes, it's all hand, handmade. Um, and, you know, they, they thought it was something worth investing their time and efforts in. Cool. So, here we are. Yeah. yeah. I, and that was important because that, you know, the, the fact that you say that, you know, a lot of starting out designers, they don't have the quality or production values. Even and some established brands. Yeah. So, I think, you know, you have to be slightly different not just in the design, but the design of your business, I guess. Totally. And also, like, from the beginning, too, your brand was super connected to music, too. Mm. Like you said before, that you were DJing and stuff like yeah. that. Um, do you remember the first album that you fell in love with? Probably, like, a Nirvana album or um, Smashing Pumpkins. Yeah. Which of the Smashing Pumpkins album? Siamese Dream. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I love this one too. They're good for, yeah, I mean, I, I listened to them like, I don't know, 200 times probably. Yeah, because yeah, like yesterday before your show, there was also like, I think, by Starlight playing mm, yeah. before. Yeah, and we I, made that playlist. Yeah. It's the same in my studio. Ah, okay, yeah. yeah. Yeah, what's your, like, I think Siamese Dream is such a special album for the Smashing Pumpkins too. Like, the, I read about the story behind it where mm. the kind of band had like a more nervous breakdown, like the... Jimmy Chamberlain, the drummer, was like a really heroin addict and stuff like mm -hmm. that and reading all this. Also like Darcy and James were a couple before and broke up during that yeah. time. And like the music it produced from the time, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. Uh, it's so amazing. I think I listened to this album too like countless times yeah. from, from, from back, yeah, back yeah. and forth. It's, it's great for driving. Yeah. yeah. I have, it's my like, go-to road trip album. Do you have a favorite song on it? Can you, can you tell? I like Mayonnaise. Yeah. Mm. It's it's great. I think mayonnaise is, is great as well, and the um, the last one I think it's uh, Luna or something yeah, like that. Luna. Yeah, mayonnaise, Space Boy, Luna. I yeah. even know the track, <laughs> the numbers. <laughs> <laughs> and like for a long time, I was really into into Hummer as well because mm. with the bass line, the starting and playing yeah. out, that's cool as well. Yeah. I think what's um, how did you was it planned from the beginning to connect music and fashion as much. Like, um, like you do now? No, because in the beginning we didn't really have a plan. <laughs> but as I got more of an audience and more, more, more um, established in the industry, I guess, I thought, okay, you know, I can't just sit in a room and make dresses or, or jackets. 
Um, and very, like maybe five or six years ago, I thought, okay, I need to see my brand as a platform rather than just, you know, my thing that's done in a room and then brought out to the world. Yeah. Um, and it was natural because, again, I thought that in the fashion industry, there were not so many kind of authentic um, collaborations between fashion designers and musicians where instead of just cut and pasting their work, um, you involve them in the creative process. So uh, the first musician I, or artist musician that I worked with is called Genesis P. Orridge yeah. from Sobin Gristle. And she's been a huge inspiration uh, kind of all my life. A bit like my therapist, in, in fact. Very, very wise uh, individual. And um, yeah, I mean, that was, a conscious decision at one point because I thought, okay, you know what? If no one's going to do it, I'm going to do it like this. Also, with your um, musical knowledge that built up over the years and your musical taste yeah. as well. But how did she reach out to to her at the beginning? Like how uh, uh, we had friends in common, and again, you know, it's like living in London um, and being kind of obsessed by the obscure. And it's, it's a really great community, you know, it's a very supportive community. And now even still I've worked with, I think we were counting 20, 23 musicians in the last six years. Yeah. Most of them know each other, you know, and they're all friends. So it's kind of the first one you work with and then get, you, you start to build a track record and an acknowledgement in the music industry um, amongst those kind of artists and, and, uh, and even more popular ones because, you know, we've had opportunities with people that I may not, you know, that, that I've heard that like uh, those kind of more iconic or underground artists and it makes it easier to work with them. Yeah. Um, like for example, last night with the Juice and Mary chain, they were, they were very easy to understand that, you know, that there is fashion and fashion and that they were not being brought in for like a commercial gig or doing something for a which, classic party. Yeah, which, which is, you know, not respectful of their art. Um, but it was more really like a corporation. Yeah, totally. So. Because like for and, the... And the more you do of that, it just snowballs, you know? Yeah. Because like for the listeners, yesterday you had your show where like, it's what not a classical show, it was more like a concert mm. where you showcased your latest clothes and it was also like part of the um, automatic show where you collaborated with a lot of artists. Yeah, exactly. How many exactly do you know? Uh, in in this in in this season, the men and women, it's 23, I think. Yeah, yeah. and you also and probably five or six new ones. Great. Yeah, and you also created like a vinyl, like for the for this too, like or um, yeah. So each of them are giving us. It's it's not finished yet, but yeah. they're um, uh, the idea is that they supply one song of their choice. And then we put like a compilation together. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Are there any artists out there you want to collaborate with? Like oh, they're yeah, still on the list? Yeah, of course. The yeah. list can always continues. Yeah. Because I can yeah. guess that you're still like more or less up to date looking for new artists. Uh, yeah, uh, always. Well. Yeah. But what, I mean, even now, like a lot of, um, especially newer artists, they even send me their music. <laughs> they already, see you, they already see you as a platform. I'm like. almost a record label. <laughs> yeah, I wish I could. Yeah. yeah. What was your latest discovery like for, for artists? Like the latest artist that you discovered that you... Um, I mean, there's one guy I really like. Um, and, you know, it's, I was li I've been listening to this guy called Ghost Man. Yeah. And um, I, I mean, I discovered him like less than one year ago and it's quite new. And this goes also this kind of genre of music where it's not metal, not rock, not noise, not rap, not trap. You it's, can't it's put your finger on it. Together. Yeah. yeah, I guess it's kind of, kind of like a blog of a patchwork of music. Um, and the concerts so yeah, that, are crazy. Yeah, I mean, I haven't seen the concert. I was in yeah. touch with him yesterday because yeah. he's actually in Germany. Yeah, yeah, I know. Um, he played there last and year. And he wanted think, to yeah. come to see the show, but um, he is, a, I mean, I've only communicated him through phone, but it seems like a very interesting guy. And, you know, I, and I think that's the direction the future is going also, you know, with these like multiples. Mm. Cool. 
How does like a collaboration look like when you do it with the artists? Is it a formula or is it? Depend well, it depends. You know, like someone like Jen, who I've known with known for many many years, um, it's very personal. And you know, some of them, the ones that I've worked with, they know the brand, and the ones that don't even they know the brand because they can see they, if they can't see it from the fashion point of view. They can, uh, if they can't see it from the fashion point of view, they see it from the list of artists I've worked with. So that's almost a mood board for them, you know. Yeah. So they can say, oh, he's he likes swans, he likes da, 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 da. that gives them a bit of context, and then it's much easier, you know. I don't have to explain myself. Yeah, cool, great. Um, always like one of the last questions from an interview is um, you've been around quite a lot and you're still traveling but imagine you're at the airport right now and you could choose anywhere you want to go where would you go and why? Oh, I don't know I mean after speaking to you right now I probably want to go to Perth and or Fremantle <laughs> there's a place called Wool Stores which closed down already yeah. it used to be a big skate spot but I probably want to go see my friends and watch some of those <laughs> videos again Yeah, yeah, great. Just to teleport there for a day or two. That would be great, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. You're I'm very welcome. much looking forward to stalking you at the Wasted Hour and our uh, relationship for the future. Great. Thank you so much. You're welcome.